Um, John mentioned yesterday that like the sub tagline of this, is, as well as being cognition and control, has been friends of Sean. So I fall in that category. And we all know in reinforcement learning, there's you know, or exploration and exploitation. And my role every year is to do the exploration part. So I'll give a talk that's completely unrelated to the workshop and the more unrelated, the better. So this time around, I asked Sean, what did you want to hear about? Uh, I offered him three different things, one of which you're gonna hear about anyway, which is work that Muriel and I have been doing for the last uh, four or five years, where we started by proving theorems, converting it into algorithms, creating chips with Rabi a year ago. It's uh, been a great fun project, which Muriel will tell you about. Um, but Muriel's gonna talk about that. Um, and then I was gonna offer him as well life science work. So I think on two occasions, probably at the previous workshops, I've described work that we're doing in life sciences, including a paper from like six or seven years ago where we proved a load of theorems that said if we could make a randomized algorithm and put it into the DNA of mice, we will be able to measure important quantities that were previously unmeasurable. Uh, and the first experimental proof of that work appeared earlier this year in Nature Immunology, or late last year in 2022, and, and other things of that ilk. And also, it, uh, uh, previously, I also spoke, I recall when Peter Glynn was here, uh, about uh, other life science work where we were understanding how cells in the immune system, how they exploit randomness. Uh, we found a lot of the molecular mechanisms of them. We found that there's different types of randomness, randomness that is shared in families and randomness is that created de novo in new cells and other things are like that. And then uh, the last set of work, which I, again, I was tempted to talk about, so I think I will next time work with Christina because one time I met Sean in London and I introduced him to Christina's lab. She works in Imperial College London and she has this amazing um, intravital microscopy techniques where they can film inside bone marrow in a live animal, uh, view fluorescently labeled cells, and look at the dynamics. And that technology has really come on where 10 years ago, they were getting little snippets of videos and you look at it and go, okay, I'm, I'm kind of getting anecdotes. And it's now got to the stage where the technology has moved on. You get long enough videos and you can see enough of the system that they're now generating data, which is where a lot of the people in this room then can contribute a lot. But I offered him all those things and he said, no. He said he wanted to hear about work that I've been doing for the last six or seven years, partly Muriel's fault, uh, with and Gergachuk and Desmond Lund. And you may remember Desmond Lund because Desmond was a student of Muriel's, so I want to thank Muriel, a very dear student. A little after you, is it Todd? Yeah, it was a little overlapped a lot, okay. And so Catherine, Catherine and Desmond, so Catherine is a, a chemist, she's the chair of the chemistry department in uh, Rutgers Camden, and Desmond is the chair of the computer science department at the moment. And um, Catherine is a forensic scientist, so a DNA forensic scientist, in fact, if you're in the Northeast of America and you have your DNA assessed in a crime lab, there's a reasonable likelihood that you enter a program that Catherine used to teach in BU. Um, and every now and then when I think I'm a bit too broad and I should narrow down and I'm contemplating, should I drop anything? It occurs to me that Catherine and Desmond could literally kill me and get away with it. So, so I don't do that. Um, but I thought I would describe this work to you today and, and do it as gently as I can. So please ask any questions. Um, and I, one of the, the big things uh, that Catherine gets, she'll get an awful lot of credit for. And in fact, the PCAS, the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, called out the work that this group was doing. Obama's President's Council, not Trump's, obviously, was, um, you know, there was a revisiting of forensic information and, and how it's used in courts and going back and discovering that some of it was being used very non-scientifically and there were miscarriages of justice as a result. And a lot of that work has now moved into NIST taking over the National Institute for Standards um, and in order to really try and only use techniques that are fully properly established. Um, and Catherine's group has made a, a huge contribution in that in that she has provided an absolutely enormous data set that's ever growing so that again people in this room can, can play with so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that um also the, some of these slides were put together by one of my students leah so if danny devito appears she can take credit for that all right um so you know what's the brief history of dna forensics so 1980s um people uh, published a paper establishing that there was a signature in your DNA um, that 
um, you have to be a little bit careful. Originally, they called it DNA fingerprinting, and the kind of suggestion was that it was somehow unique to you. Now they call them match statistics. Basically, there's a signature in your DNA that's very distinctive. I'm going to describe it and explain how it's measured. And the, essentially, the likelihood that, that you know, two people on Earth with signature is the same is, is almost negligible, right? But so that in that sense, it's, it's almost unique to you. But it is a stochastic process that generates it. And so you can't say it's unique. And, and you know, it was used, of course, it's, it's been the gold standard in criminal investigations ever since. And in the, in the 1990s, the FBI were the first international uh, you know, uh, justice organization that defined a specific set of measurements that you would have to take to identify someone from, from their DNA. And that meant, for example, that they could build databases. So like Sean gets arrested, they, they take his DNA, they measure it and they stick it in a database. So it's a consistent measurement over time. And, and again, I'll explain what that measurement is. Um, and that has developed a little over time uh, to decrease the likelihood that uh, Sean and I would be confused if, if, they, if we measure both of them. Um, and in the US, there's a, a funding agency, the National Institute, Institute of Justice, uh, which funds work and development in that, in that region. I know Catherine has also actually had money from the army because the army has been interested in doing um, identification rapidly on site. Um, so that there is army funded work in this space. Too. Okay. But despite the fact that like DNA forensics really is the gold standard, if, for example, you take a sample from a crime scene and there are maybe only two people who contributed to it, say the victim and a potential perpetrator, and then you take a sample from me, you will definitively be able to determine whether it was the me that contributed to the sample or not. But despite that, you will have perhaps read uh, some of the articles from ProPublica and Wired and others uh, highlighting miscarriages of justice that have occurred more, pre more recently uh, from the use of DNA forensics. And the reason for that is not really fundamentally in the technology itself, but it's more to do with people like us and them. It's to do with the interpretation of complicated signals. So what happened was they take DNA forensics and they started using the technology um, to try and understand and do match statistics, calculate something about the likelihood that I contributed to a sample, or the sample became more complicated. And in the effort to do that, they use a lot of numerical stochastic techniques, and some of them have proven to be flawed. And, and there's a lot of very serious horror stories, and it's more complicated even than that in America, because um, there's, there's a kind of tip of the iceberg issue here. And, and that if a prosecutor comes to you and says, you know, you're, we have your DNA at the scene, even if you know you're innocent, you will probably plead guilty because you're likely to be on remand for a couple of years before you go to court. And you know that the, ju the jury is going to believe the DNA evidence, even if it's been dinged on the likely. And there were some crazy serious scandals here. If you want to read about that, there was a New York crime lab uh, that built in house software. Uh, and in order to fund the, the crime lab, you, uh, they were even doing taking samples from elsewhere in the world and processing them. And every now and then, they would look at the output of their algorithm and they would look at the data that they would put in and they would know something was not quite right, you know, because like, you could kind of interpret the data. And so they would tweak the answers. Um, so there's all that sort of stuff going on. Um, so we're going to try and explain how some of this came about. Uh, and as I said, there is, a, there is a huge data set. So if you have students who are interested and you have other techniques you'd like to use to play, you can just go and do that. Which is one of the great things that Catherine did as well. Okay, so Danny DeVito. Um, all right, DNA samples can be basically collected from any type of, of cell, pretty much, right? And then nearly every cell in your body, you have 46 chromosomes, you know, so um, in pairs, right? So two of them are sex chromosomes, and the rest are, are, are pairs. Um, and the measurement that you do is basically a partial measurement of the DNA. Um, the thing that you might be most familiar with, you know, is of course DNA is a, is a it, for what we're going to consider is just a big long string in, in a four character alphabet. And, you know, if you go and get um, measured with 23andMe or Ancestry.com or whatever, they're looking, they're looking for SNPs. So SNPs are single poly, you know, nucleotide polymorphism. So, you know, there's a certain part of the code that describes the color of my eyes and because my eyes are green, that the, the code will look a little bit different and your eyes go brown or whatever. SNPs are not what we use for DNA forensics. 
to be really clear. So in order to do this, in order to understand something about the genetic makeup of your genes, we have to go and actually read the sequences. You don't do that in DNA forensics. Instead, um, what happens is, uh, and, and there are probably updated numbers now, but of all of your DNA, actually only a small amount of it is what's called coding, which is that it actually describes how to produce proteins. And the rest of it is of a different form. An awful lot of it is called satellite DNA. Um, and what satellite DNA looks like, and in particular, the like satellites we highlight, these are really microsatellites, is at a certain location on a given chromosome. If we look at anyone in this room, at that location in this chromosome, there will be a little string of characters, say, say a four-letter string. And you will find that four-letter string in all of our DNA. But what will differ is that in me, I will have um, maybe four or six back-to-back -back copies of that little string. And Sean might have five, and Muriel might have three, and there's heterogeneity in the population. So what happens is at this location on this chromosome, everybody in the room, you will find this microsatellite for this little, little, little string, but there will be a different number of back-to-back -back copies. So listen, I'm going to use you as my bellwether, Sean. So if anything is unclear, I want you to, to let me know. And of course, you have two chromosomes, one, one inherited from either parent. And therefore, if they're heterogeneous in, in the population, you'll actually have two such integers, right? One that you inherited from your mother and one from you know, your father, right? And your DNA, the thing that they identify, should they ever take a section of your, a sample of your, from you and go and try and compare your DNA signature with something from crime scene, is actually they measure, they take about 20 locations and they measure these pairs of integers. This is the essential signature of who you are, right? Still with me? Okay. And that's the core signature of, of who you are. So the, the um, and they're, they're measured on different chromosomes. So like we have the marked up chain network in the front of the room so that they mix very quickly, right? You know, you've inherited one from your mother and one from your father. You're gonna pass on one of them to each of your kids. And so between the generations, it's gonna mix very rapidly. And because they're on different the measurements are on different chromosomes, they're all gonna mix independently. And therefore, you know, within a couple of generations, you get an awful lot of dilution of those numbers. Um, and of course, your, your ability to be distinguished comes from how heterogeneous are these within your population. Of course, like if, if everybody always had, you know, four repeats, well, there will be no information in there. Um, and instead these are, they're regarded as being highly variable, right? So if I take Sean's measurements, for a typical human, if I take one of their measurements, now I have to be cautious about the truth here, but there's like, you know, a one in billion chance kind of thing, or a one in 10 billion, or one in 100 billion, they increase the number of chromosomes, the number of sites that they're measuring, but somebody else would have the exact same set of numbers as you. Shaking his head, not very happy with it. Okay. Um, and of course, these things are heterogeneous in, in, in the population. So the other thing they have to go about, right, because we're going to we're going to end up doing hypothesis tests, right, about what's the likelihood that it was a Sean signature contributing to the thing or, or mine or whatever. And so they need to know something about the heterogeneity of the individual. Um, uh, alleles in the population as a whole. And so they take samples um, from a population and they build up statistical tables about the frequency of each allele. Right? And so they'll be used um, when one challenges, did Sean contribute to the, to the sample that I have or did somebody random from the population, would I prefer the, the hypothesis into random from the population did? Okay. And some of these things are weird if you go and read them. I remember taking the data for Puerto Rico, because of course, even those things, these things are random in the population, depending on which population you come from, really there is some localization, right? You know? Um, yeah. Uh, this, so this is not actually this is a this is a pictorial representation of the thing. It's not it's not it's not actually a sample of the real data. Um, what you what you find is uh, enclosed communities that marry within themselves 
have one distribution and it's still quite a broad distribution, but it's distinct from, from our model, yeah. Um, and in fact, you know, like this, this picture is not a great picture because the reality is if you only had three alleles at a given thing, that would be very bad. Um, but the thing is you typically only have maybe six or eight. It's not a huge number. Right? And what you're really using is that you're, you're requiring that, you know, 20 pairs of numbers that have a range of six to eight and picked from some distribution that, that, that the total signature is being okay. okay. So if I take a clean sample of DNA, and this is actually the output of, of a measurement of a clean sample of DNA, I get something that looks like this, okay? So what happens is each one of these um, things at the top defines a locus of DNA. So it defines which chromosome it's on, right? So D13 is actually the 13th chromosome. Some of them have different names, but like D1 is on the first chromosome. So it's telling you which chromosome you're measuring. And then the number afterwards is just telling you where it's, a, you know, it, it's a, it, it maps to where in the DNA you're measuring. So it's just telling you what you're measuring. And from a clean sample of an individual, you get a measurement that looks like this. So let me try and describe it. So say I take, um, say, D10. So at D10, there's two strong spikes. So what you do, and I'll, I'll explain how you, you measure this in a minute. But basically, I take a sample from the individual, and I'm going to try and measure these integers. And measure the, the sort of output that I get is there's a range of possible in integers that I could measure, and the ones that are very tall spikes are the ones that correspond to who they are. There's going to be some effects on here, like where you always see there's all these little little nubs besides these ones that I've tagged as actually being the genotype of the individual. And these are inherent things that necessarily occur when we go and do the measure. So there are artifacts that we know must exist. In the so basically, this individual is then divided by all these numbers. Now, in some locations, you can see like on D1, they only have uh, a single, uh, and that's because first this person had a, was a 15-15. Both of their chromosomes had 15 piece, you know? Um, you have two chromosomes, but they, they could have the same number, which also complicates matters, right? So you're a pair of numbers, but they could be repeating. Okay, Sean? Yeah. All right. So the way you measure something like this is you take a sample of cell, cellular matter, uh, you lyse it to uh, expose the DNA, and then you probably have all heard about polymerase chain reaction because of uh, COVID tests, if nothing else. Um, and so I have you know, a copy of DNA and I wanna read uh, something about um, how many repeat units I have, how many, what is the signature in that DNA? And what you do is you, you go through these cycles where you heat the DNA so that it separates and then you cool it. When you cool it, you take a copy of the DNA of the part of the DNA of interest. Um, and when you take a copy of it, you then heat again, separate the DNA again, and that original thing that you made a copy of, you make another copy of, and you go through this exponential process of heating and cooling that looks like a branching process, where which has like 95% efficiency. So you take loads and loads and loads of copies, although a stochastic number, and generating copies of the section of interest. And that's what you measure. You go, because like actually DNA is very small and very hard to measure and whatever. So what you do is you basically, you typically do something like 30 cycles. So if I, if I only started with one cell, I will end up with something of the order of two to the 30 copies of the part, part of the DNA that I'm interested in. And then I'm going to go measure that. And then that's how I'm going to measure that. And, um, oops. Yeah. Um, so in fact, you, you can do it, you, as I will show you, you can do it from single cells. So as long as the DNA is present in the tube, you will be able to amplify it. There's an issue where, for example, and, and I'll explain the artifacts, where you can have dropout, which is where the allele never makes it into the tube and then you can't amplify it. Um, and there's one other effect, because we're, we're going to do like, as I said, like 30 cycles. So if you start with an awful lot of mass, then eventually the reaction becomes inefficient because the whole thing gets so crowded. Um, but in the initial phase, it, it, you know, it looks 
exponential, and it's actually got about 95% efficiency. So about, you know, 95% of the time when you go through this process, the thing will be copied. Yeah? So what you're going to do is I have, um, I want to measure this length really, right? And I, I don't want to go and read the sequence because that's expensive and complicated. So I want to measure the length. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through this process to give you two, two to the 30 copies, what I hope are, are good copies. And from having two to the 30 copies of it, I'm going to, it's going to be easier for me to measure the length. And the way I do it is this thing called uh, electrophoresis. What happens is I'm going to push the material uh, through a gel. And depending on the mass of the sequence, it will, it will move at a, a greater or slower speed. And so what you do is we put down a length scale. So something that has length one, you know, one copy, two copies, three copies, four copies. So we put a known length scale down. And then we take the sample that we took from you and we push it through. And because we've got two to the 30-ish copies of this thing, we get a really strong signature uh, aligning with one of those lengths. Um, one of the things about criminal justice, you know, often people, if you give talks like this, people say, well, why don't you use sequencing or whatever, right? Um, they even use cheap test tubes because nobody wants to pay for criminal justice. Right? You know, so at one stage, they discovered in the cheap test tubes that they were using, and about half the DNA that they put in was getting stuck to the tube uh, and not being measured but the, because the tubes were one, you know, 50 cents rather than a dollar. Um, so sequencing is very expensive, whereas electrophoresis is, is a, a lot cheaper. Yeah. And, yeah, and you can already see what the difficulty will be. The difficulty will be when I take a sample from Sean, I know it's all from Sean, I can put it into the system and I can take his measurement. The difficulty at the crime scene is, you know, I have blood or a sample and an unknown pe number of people in unknown quantities will have contributed to that sample. And when I push it through this process, I'm going to get a composite measurement. I'm going to get the interleaving of all of those signals. And then what we're going to try and do is do an inference to decide. After it. Um, so, you know, so this is what you do. You get an electrocardiogram on our side. Some things you get very known artifacts. That first thing that you saw, this person was a 25, 23. But somehow we get, you know, we get signal at 22 and 24. The reason for that is in that process, where we're amplifying and taking copies of the DNA, you get something called slippage, where it's just the, the copying is imperfect. And it's like about a, a half a percent chance that you're, you're, ten, you're in the process of, of copying it and you fall one short. And as a result, um, because we're going to go through an exponential process of, of expansion, and because you've got like a half a percent chance, you necessarily always get this thing, which is called stutter. Um, Okay, so this is going to be an artifact that's one of the inconveniences. It gives us, an, you know, as well as where we have the true measurement, we're going to have something that's one repeat unit length smaller. So we get a bit of signal there. Uh, and sometimes, actually, in, this, in the previous case, you can see you get stutter on the stutter. So what happens is the thing itself then, you know, I'm now taking copies of the thing that's a little bit shorter, and there's a chance that I will, that will stutter more. Um, you can get forward stutter where it makes an accidental longer copy. That's much less likely. It's an order of magnitude smaller. You don't see it anywhere near as much, but it can happen. And um, to, the, to the question earlier on, you can have dropout, which is where the DNA never made it into the tube, and therefore you can't amplify it. So even though we knew this person was an 11.7, you get no measurement of the 7. All right. Um, and then you can get drop-in. Drop-in is where um, the sample becomes contaminated by someone else's DNA. There are a couple of pretty amazing stories where in Germany, for example, they were hunting for a long time for a mass serial killer who it turned out to be worked in the lab that made the test tubes and her DNA was ending up, a small amount of her DNA was ending up polluting a fair number of test tubes. So whenever they went to the measurement, they always found her signature in there. Um, so there's other, there's other instances as well. Okay. So, um, but if I, take a, if I take a clean sample from a single person, I can do the measurement and interpret it fairly readily. And in the original version of DNA forensics, the things that people would use in court, originally, if they were getting super clean samples like this, they would do what's called the leal calling. What would you do? High pass, threshold, filter. You know, you, you can almost look at it and read it off, right? Despite the fact that, you know, clearly, you know, clearly there's some variability. You know, this may have been 
for example, that the very first round of amplification wasn't successful for, the, for this well. And as a result, it's only half the height, right? Because one early round of non replication can result in it. But um, I, I'm, this is the, the, the problem, right? So if you take uh, a sample from a crime scene, uh, one or two people have contributed to it, then I think probably most people in the room would guess you could probably do something really clean there. And that is the, the, the gold standard, and that is what you see in talk a lot. The reason why life became more difficult is start applying the method to more complicated samples. Like previously, what happened is you take a sample from crime scene, you go and produce an electric paragraph that looks like this. They might give up on that and not, not use it in court. You may not go and talk to, the, to them and say, we had a match or whatever. So this uh, is one of, uh, it's probably more now, but 27,000 such samples that are in the database that you can go down and download and have a look. So it was created by Catherine and her group uh, over a number of years where she takes bloods from known genotypes. So you go and measure the bloods and you know exactly what their, what their signature is. And then she artificially makes make mixtures. So we know what ground truth is. And she goes off and produces electrophoregrams. So if I gave you an electrophoregram like this, you know, and this would not be a typical or complicated crime scene sample, the question is, you know, even to predict how many people do you think contributed to this, right? Pairs of integers that are un unknown quantities, right? Um, so, yeah, this, this is a very complicated sample, right? And, and, and you're unlikely to be able to, to draw a good inference from it. It actually has uh, four contributors because we happen to know the ground truth and, and the colors are tagging their alleles. Because again, it's not, it's not only that their signatures might be in there together, but they're in an unknown ratio. You know, like it could be, you have a lot of Sean's blood and a very small sample from me. And then I might look like stutter in Sean's signature or vice versa, and, you know? Um, and so it's samples like these that have been leading the interpretation of samples like these that have been leading to those miscarriages of justice that you can now read about. But um, how, how do you assess them at all? How do you assess them? Um, what you do, and, and this you might enjoy this because this is true, this is what you do in court, is um, to take evidence like this, you, you tr the standard at the moment is you trade off two different hypotheses. Prosecution's hypothesis is that the electrophorogram, so that, that thing I've shown you, is that it contains the suspect's DNA plus a number of others in an unknown random composition. Right? And the defense's hypothesis is that someone of the same ethnicity, right, taking into account the fact that, you know, if, if, if they believe Sean is a person of interest and they're going to compare him against it, the they might have some indication that it was, you know, a white Californian or whatever, male who contributed to it. And then you take a random, yeah, you know, they're trying to assess the possibility that it was some other random person from that um, milieu who, who contributed. And they calculate a likelihood ratio. Right? So what's the probability of the evidence? And the way that's done presently is through what's called continuous methods. This should disturb everybody in the room. I think it's a little bit, certainly disturbed me a bit. Um, the continuous methods actually try and estimate these likelihoods from the entire signal, including their fluorescence values. So you basically build a generative model where you say, okay, uh, which is calibrated to the machine that made the electrophorogram. But you say there's kind of like, if there was a true allele here, there will be a log normal distribution for the fluorescence at the, at the appropriate peak. Uh, and I would expect to have a stutter of a certain size. And that's how I'm going to compute likelihood. And so I do that for the, the person of interest. Um, and for the, for the defenses uh, thing, you know, part of the problem as well, the probability of the evidence given a random individual, the whole point of our signature was that everybody on the planet would essentially have a unique one. So in order to do that computation, they do it by Monte Carlo. Right? So you take random uh, genotypes, assuming that they were composed from uh, your frequency tables, and, and that's what you do. You say, what's the likelihood of the signal given that? And, and, and then the interesting, the one last interesting point on this, which again, 
I don't know, will the muser horrify people? How do you think you're going to translate this likelihood ratio into a confidence that you share with the jury? Does anyone want to guess? Trust me, whatever you guess, it's going to be worse. <laughs> so you have to give a variable description. So that's what the expert has to do. It has to be a variable description. And, and here's the current recommendation for that variable description. It says, you know, if the likelihood ratio is low, uh, between one and 10, so on the log scale, then the variable expression is weak. If it's between 10 and 100, it's moderate, and so on. This is the recommendation without reference to what our model was, right? You know, and uh, I won't belabor the point, but there are two primary uh, uh, pieces of software being used to do this estimate in courts in the US, and they're both closed source. So they publish papers telling you what they claim they're doing in their model, um, and they're being large in the cases trying to get access to the source code to find out what it's actually, what is it really doing. And there have been some examples where judges have asked that both pieces of software be used, uh, and then totally unsurprisingly, you get different numbers from them, right? Because this, these are essentially like density estimates, right? You're, you're you know, and from different parameterized models. So, um, and you know, we and others have written papers showing that yeah. Yeah. Where's Clay's global? So normally, uh, so when they do this for a person of interest, or the person of interest, they take somebody else from, from the same ethnicity. So there are tables. Uh, one of my humorous early experiences with it is there's a table, for example, for Puerto Rico. And I went and looked it up, and it was crashing my computer when I, when I tried to use it as, as a table for the distribution. And the reason why it turned out was that it had, when you added up the probabilities, you got a number bigger than one. And the reason why you get a number bigger than one is there's a rule that when they make these frequency tables, if in the population sample that they take, they see an allele, but they see fewer than five people, they pretend they saw five people. Anyway, but yeah, so the, there, is, there is quite a lot of localization. The other very complicated thing in here, which Muriel made a very significant contribution to, is I said there's like a bunch of random people. You also have to decide how many random people do you put in, right? Um, depending on the sample, you know, so it's a bit self preferential. And at the moment, what happens is a bit of an argument between the forensic teams, and they make a, an, an expert decision on how many people they think contributed to the sample. And of course, one more person or one less person can make the interpretation hugely different. Because as you can imagine, if you assume that there was an extra person in the mix, then the likelihood that Sean was one of those people is decreases. You know? um, so, without talking at great length, I thought I would mention, because I, I want to tell you what we're doing now. But th this data is available. It's not the easiest to read if anybody ever has an interest or wants to send a student to do it for a fun time project or whatever, and you have trouble, let us know and tell you how to convert it into something. Um, Muriel started working with Catherine and then, and then I got roped in and Muriel stepped out, which is how that, this kind of came about. But they did a lot of work uh, on calculating the posterior distribution of how many people were contributing to the sample, for example. And um, we also have a system for calculating those likelihood ratios, which people can use, and you can change the model in and see how it affects and that kind of thing. Um, and, uh, interestingly, I just mentioned in passing, a team in the Netherlands proved a theorem, which is a little bit surprising. It's really just a calculation that tells you you can actually treat the number of contributors as a nuisance variable. So you can use the system that Muriel and others invented to calculate the posterior likelihood of how many people contributed. And then you can integrate that. And so calculate the likelihood ratio, weight it by how many the likelihood that you had that many people in the mix. And you can actually calculate the proper likelihood ratio. And so we've done that. The people that proved the theorem didn't have a system to do it, but we have the system to do it. And that works reasonably well. These samples, they get very complicated. And you know, as I was saying, you know, you're trying to Monte Carlo sample over a huge space. The more people you think are in there, you get mad combinatorial exponential explosion and everything, right? Including the mixture ratios, because you have to make prior assumptions on randomness and 
who contributed what, uh, whether that's coupled across alleles and so on. Okay. It's a very interesting place to always be reading about. Um, I thought uh, I'm, I'm probably speaking a bit long, but let's, let's see if I can go this 10 minutes. Or not. But I thought I'd tell you a bit about, well, what are, what are we doing now? As well as all that, that other stuff. Um, because I've had the good fortune of working with wet lab people and accounting the basic sciences, as a lot of people in this room will know, even if you have to fight for money to do your experiments, they will give you money to do exciting experiments and have good experimental equipment, right, Todd? Yeah, if you ask nicely enough, right? But, um, so I have colleagues, you know, one of the big things that's happened in the life sciences in the last decade is technologies to do single cell measurements of really increased, right? So a lot of technologies out there by which you can take single uh, cell measurements. And part of the problem, I think, that was fundamental here is that I'm giving you the combined signal and asking you to interpret. And I think at that stage, you're already pretty much in trouble. Um, and people are starting to use, we're already starting to use uh, these techniques on what's called complex samples, low template DNA. So you have a gun being passed around the community and people are touching it and you get small amounts of DNA from different people and you're trying to do interpretations. That, that's been one of the things that been, um, people have been particularly interested in. Um, touch DNA. So all the way back, in um, 1997, people had already established that if you give me a single cell, I can take this measurement for you. So from a single cell, I should be able to measure these short tandem repeats. I should be able to get a signature from them. Now, all of the randomness is higher, right? Because we're going to go through through our PCR, our Galton-Moxon branching process, but we're going to start with a single copy of everything, you know? And so like, if I don't get amplification the first round, it will have the height and all that kind of thing. So our samples will be individually noisier and whatever, but it is too. And of course, there's multiple techniques for doing this. So I convinced Catherine's lab uh, to start doing this a number of years ago. Um, and the great thing about Catherine's lab, is she does everything at scale. So when you read forensics papers, one of the troubling things is they develop an algorithm and they may have had three or four or five samples. And that's what they're basing on well, my algorithm works because I had five electric paragrams and it does well. Um, you know, and so Catherine does everything at scale. So they had a student, a postdoc actually, a British um, Pico Pet hold. So they take uh, actually saliva samples from a number of people. And you go in and Pico Pet individual cells and you go off and process them and make electric paragrams. And she bought bloods. Um, and again, for these individuals, we know their signature because you can take a big bulk sample of it. You can go off and make a clean measurement. And then we take individual cells and we take measurements of each of them, right? And so the idea, of course, um, is as opposed to taking the whole milieu and measuring a joint signal, is that we would separate the individual cells and measure them uh, on their own, right? So you're actually creating an electroparagram for each of them. And um, so, you know, the idea, of course, is as opposed to having a composite image, we now have an electrophoregram for each cell that was in the mixture, right? And so like it's, you know, what I'm trying to do is separate the, the signal at its source rather than, than afterwards. But the real question is now, okay, now I've gone from giving you one single high dimensional kind of object to giving you a load of them. So how are you going to interpret them? I'll tell you what we've been doing. And if you have a better idea, once the papers are published and stuff, likely the data will become available and you can have a go. Because like Catherine Reed cares about criminal justice. We don't care if your idea is better than ours or not. We care that people who don't go to jail. We shouldn't go to jail and people who should go to jail, we should. Yeah. Um, so let me tell you what we've been doing. Uh, let me first tell you, if you take these um, single cell electrograms, uh, just by looking at them with exploratory statistics, you can see that they separate on different individuals. So if I give you a bunch of single cell electrograms, um, so we're just by looking at them. So one way of looking at them is we can take their signal, which is you know, how much fluorescence do you get at each potential allele at each locus, and we can just concatenate them and make a, one single high dimensional vector. That's about a thousand dimensional vector, where what it is is how much fluorescence did I measure at this locus and this allele. Makes sense? Okay. And if you do that, mm -hmm and you pick the right distance. So if I make these high dimensional vectors, as long as I, I am dumb and pick something like Euclidean distance, as long as I pick something like cosine dis dissimilarity, if I take pairs of single cell electrograms from a single genotype, 
what I find is that they have um, <clears throat> very low dissimilarity, right? They sit in the same high parts of the high dimensional space. And if I take single cell electrophorogram from two different individuals and I measure their distances, they look very far apart. So that's kind of suggestive that you should be able to separate these things, right? So I should be able to do so. Let me give you another picture which might not be awarded. Dash, yeah, so sorry, dashed. They're, yeah, sorry, the dashed are, are different individuals, but you're taking multiple electrophorograms from that individual, to par you know, measuring the distance between them and calculating the distribution. So, so one of these might be you, one of them would be me. And then on the right, what I've done is I've taken an electrophorogram from you, an electrophorogram from me, measured a distance, take another one from you and me. When we find that they, they, the distribution looks very similar, dissimilar, if we take them across individuals from a single individual, they're very similar. Do you think that there's a hint that they should be separable? I think the, the next picture may make it a little bit, bit clearer. So because of this exponential uh, thing that you get when you do PCR, <clears throat> the distributions look like log norm. When you take the log of them, they look a bit Gaussian. So how, how, how many rep amplicons I get. So this is all going to be in the log space. But for example, here, I don't know, there's probably like uh, 60 single cell electrophorograms. You take them, you make these high dimensional vectors, and you just do a two dimensional PCA in them. Right? So, and if you do a two dimensional PCA in them, you find that they, they cluster into four different groups, and the four different groups corresponds to the four different individual genotypes. So these high dimensional vectors, you know, and it makes sense, you know, so like, uh, <clears throat> even though Todd and I might be, you know, 10, 11, we might, might, we might share a little part of the space together. We're really looking at a measurement that's like 20 different locations uh, across a thousand possibilities. And in the other ones, we will be different. And so we separate well. Yeah? Um, so even something as simple as PCA tells you that would work. And the other thing is here, what you're seeing is that uh, the more intense the signal is, which really corresponds to how good is the electrophorogram, how much of Sean's distinctive measurement have I managed to get, the more I get, the more separated they look, the better the electrophorogram. So I'll give you the, yeah. Yeah, so that's, yeah, so right. So I'm going to give you a bunch of single cell electrophorograms, but as you said, even if they look like they're grouped together, how, how do I know how many groups I'm looking for? So, and, and again, this, I mean, this work is likely to appear later this year. So uh, if you have a better idea, as you said, please. So what, what are we, what we've been doing is you can take your favorite clustering algorithm. And you know, so I'm going to give you these high dimensional things. You can take your favorite clustering algorithm. A lot of the clustering algorithms require you as a user to tell how many groups am I looking for? There's a very beautiful methodology in statistics uh, called model-based clustering. Uh, one of the things I have been I had been doing before I moved to Northeastern was running a very large doctoral center in, in data science and happen to work a lot with people in statistics. And the way model-based clustering works, I don't know if I have a slide describing it, is, but I'm gonna say it in words because everybody in this room will get it very well. And it's a very well-established technique. Uh, uh, you basically, if I give you uh, samples, don't have to be high dimensional, but it works very well in high dimensions. And what I'm going to assume is that they, they're generated by a Gaussian mixture model. Okay? So I'm going to assume that there's a Gaussian mixture model that generated them, but I don't know how many components there are in the Gaussian mixture. And I don't know what the mean or variance or covariance of any of the mixtures are. And what they do is they use an EM style algorithm, um, which also manages using like a Bayesian information criterion style thing to, 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 to try and determine how many groups are there as well as where are they. Now, the, as I said, the core signal, the real signal when really looks log normal, you know? <laughs> it, so, you know, when I took the log of it, assuming these things are where the fall part of the signal is, is really nicely Gaussian. And actually even between a position and a stutter position is also nicely jointly Gaussian, so it looks very well. Um, 
And so that's what we've been doing. We've been using model-based clustering to, to take these milieu of signal cell electrograms, figure out how many people we think contributed, separating them into groups. And then the advantage at the end of it is if the clustering went right, right which is of course the crucial thing, then these bunch of single cell electrograms came from a single individual and I need only do a hypothesis test on whether it was Sean or one random person, you know, not some random number of others. And uh, there's no real super confusion. For some reason, um, PowerPoint is deleting all of my subscripts, but never mind. So the, you can even do a little bit more. You can do a little bit of back of envelope mathematics. It says, uh, which is correct. It says, if I give you the whole totality of the data, if I want to calculate that original likelihood ratio, the, the likelihood ratio between the prosecution and defenses hypothesis, yeah. Extra paragraph here, yeah. It could do, it could do if you, it, so it, it could do. Um, where the, um, the assumption about the distribution of individuals, where we're gonna use it is when we do the likelihood graph calculation, because we're gonna do it with the person of interest versus somebody else. But if you knew in advance, um, then I, you probably could do that. One of my hesitancies is I don't like using the same data twice when I'm doing an inference, and you know, because uh, you can go back and read about uh, the, the, the very early argument between Pearson and others where Pearson was wrong about reusing the data. So we're, we're kind of using the data and putting it into groups in a way where we're not kind of forensically aware, which are kind of high dimensional representations of the data, bunching them together, and then we're going to do then we're going to say, okay, now these things are electrograms. Now I'm going to compare them with people and whatever. But you certainly could, I, I suspect, use extra pars. Um, other people, of course, are very keen to use machine learning methods or neural networks or autoencoders or blah, blah, blah. I will tell you, even if you do invent a beautiful idea, the legal requirement is that your method has to be scientifically accepted by the community before it can be used in court. Um, so there is, a, there is a higher standard. Yeah. I'm out of time on it. Yeah, okay. Let me show you. So Catherine made two 2,063 single cell electrograms taken from known genotypes. We made um, some from skin cells and some from blood. So we actually know what the source is. And so what does that allow us to do? It allows us to um, forward, forward, back. It allows us to make, uh, to make complicated collections where of course our algorithms are not gonna know what the ground truth is, but we can go and cluster them and then go and calculate likelihood ratios. And then we actually, we knew you know, after the fact we can pull off our blinds and go, well, did we get it right or not? And, and so what happens when you do this is the model-based clustering works super well. There are kind of two error types that you might have. One is that you, you, know, you could have character clustering where, where you know, every single cell electrogram from a single genotype ends up in a single group. You have something over clustering um, where um, we separate single cell electrograms from an individual into two different groups. That's the lesser of two evils. And then the other one would be misclustering, where I take two single cell electrograms from two different genotypes and I stick them in the one group. Actually, if I do that, it's really easy to tell post fact, to be honest, because you can look at them and, and use very simple techniques to see. But model based clustering essentially never really misclusters, or at least in our hands. We give and we make hugely complicated samples that you could never ever do with the bulk system. Things where you've got 60 electrograms, but um, there's like 15 from one person, and two from another, and two from another, and two from another, and two from another. And even though there's only like two electrograms from those individuals, model based clustering will, will guess how many people there are. Um, so, what you end up getting is you get a little bit of overclustering, so sometimes you, you take your group and separate it into two that you shouldn't. Um, but at the end of it, you can. I think here I'm giving you an example. So, and I'm sorry, Sean, I'm going to finish in as quickly as possible. Here's an example where each one of these is a single cell electrograph that's overlaid. So, in some sense, if I had measured them as 
altogether, right? I've got this hugely complicated mixture. We stick it from, through the, the clustering algorithm, separates them into groups. And the beauty of these single cell electrophorograms is when I separate them into groups and overlay them, you could almost read the genotype off, right? You can almost read it. That's a, for other reasons. It means you can use it even if you don't have a suspect. So I can take this and I can guess what the, the genotype was and I can stick it into a database and search, right? which other methods don't allow you to do. But I think you'll see, you know, if you looked at this, you could read where the spikes were. And this is for the fifth cluster, which has 32 electric paratypes. So this paragraph, so this one only has two. You know, so it, it separates them really well because in the high dimensional space, they're very far apart from each other. Um, and basically what it allows you to do is you end up getting super high likelihood ratios for persons of interest, and you get super negative ones for people who, are, who, who did not contribute. Because you basically reduce the problem back to the best case you could have had, which is single individual. Okay. Well, we're still struggling to get traction uh, with Prime Labs. We think we probably will in the long run. They don't like anything that costs money. Yeah. Criminal justice, they don't like spending money on it. But um, probably for complicated um, and serious crimes that they might do. And there are a number of companies who are trying to make the microfluidics cheap enough to, to enable it to be done. So, yeah, time. Yeah, really, yeah, time and effort. Actually, funny enough, uh, you use less reagents, so that part's cheaper. <laughs> um, you use less re reagents. So you'll use less in the PCR because you're doing single cells and, and we do it in smaller groups. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, really, it's really time and effort, even the purchase of a machine. So like a, um, I'll put up the closing slide and just mention that, you know, um, you know, there were instances where like the prime lab and for all of Virginia, it was like three people doing all of the samples, you know, and so they would have to be taken out and retrained and given a new machine. Yeah, anyway, yeah, it's bit surprising. Anyway, so for, for this kind of work, we're very hopeful about it, but actually one of the, one of the big caveats that I didn't touch upon is of course, um, sexual assault cases are very important and uh, sperm only contains a random half of your DNA, right? So it only contains a random half because there's only one, one of your two chromosomes. Uh, I, I think we should be able to actually update the model-based clustering. One of the joys about model-based clustering is you can define the model. So although I described it for Gaussian mixtures, it's used for all sorts of other things. You can use, there's actually an algorithm to define what the model is. So somehow I need to, if, if MIJ give us the money to do it, I will figure out how to write a model that has like 50% dropout. So you know, you only get half and trying to do the instant. But hopefully it will work there because they're super important cases. Um, but as a, if, if, if anyone is interested in the existing thing, which is the thing that we use in part, which is the analysis of these complicated samples, and you have your beautiful algorithm that you can apply, there is now a gorgeous data set. It's readily available from Captain's website. Okay, there you go.